Welcome to Cybersecurity Awareness TV, episode number 430, recorded May 6, 2023. My name is Mac Jackson, Jr. I am your cybersecurity consultant and researcher. If this is the first time you have seen my show here on WWDB-TV, we dedicate our show by helping you protect yourself from the fastest growing crimes of the 21st century by providing you information, tips, and informing you about today's digital world. I would like to thank everyone who's been a part of our show over the years here at WWDB TV and supporting us at Cybersecurity Awareness TV. And if you'd like to help our show as well, you can definitely get a hold of me by going to my website at MacJacksonJR.com. That's MacJacksonJR.com. Also, folks, we're on all social media out there on the internet. You can find us there. Remember to share, like, and subscribe, and hit that notification button to keep informed of the latest news on cybersecurity awareness. In today's episode, we will discuss in episode one, the evolving landscape of cybersecurity, folks, and it's ever-changing every week. There's something new. In our second segment, we, it, we go through an FBI report about scams. There's grant scams, and this week, folks, we have another term for you, pig butchering. Yes, pig butchering, folks. Incredible, these scammers that are out there. In the third segment, we'll go through tips and techniques on how to, to protect yourself and improve business productivity with security. In our first segment, the evolving landscape of cybersecurity. In this first story, we will discuss the FDA's cybersecurity policies for medical devices, an increasing topic of the healthcare industry and its technology. The Food and Drug Administration is aware of the growing significance of cybersecurity in the medical industry, uh, basically surrounding the devices and implementing guidelines to ensure patient safety in protecting sensitive data. In previous episodes here of Cybersecurity Awareness TV, we have brought to you stories about ransomware attacks on the hospital industry and how the healthcare facilities have been basically shut down because of this type of cyber threats and the need for a robust cybersecurity measures. The Federal, the federal um, Food and Drug Administration has explored the cybersecurity measures and come up with some protocols to ensure that the medical devices are in compliant nationwide and basically worldwide as well. By coming up with these types of controls, they can design better products and making sure that the manufacturers and the hospital facilities have cybersecurity measures in them that can thwart cyber attacks and also ransomware as well. The FDA is also encouraging the adopting of the so-called Bill of Materials they call it the CBOM, and it's a list of different hardware and software components within the medical devices, right? Um, these components and discussions about cybersecurity measures are a collaboration of providers that can help these hospitals and other nonprofits themselves understand the potential threats and make informed decisions. Additionally, the FDA, with this collaboration, um, with their stockholders as well as the manufacturers and healthcare virals work with researchers and academics worldwide as well to keep informed on what they can do to mitigate these damages of cyber crimes, fostering a proactive response, right? Proactive approach and maintain cybersecurity in the healthcare system. Our story continues here by going to a report from Twitch Tech Network. Medical devices are a great way to save lives, but not so great for actually protecting your data. In fact, we talked about this. Some hospitals actually have those devices in air gap environments. Now, according to this dark reading article, that's why the FDA has issued a new set of rules to make sure these devices don't become easy targets for hackers and cyber criminals. Now, from now on, medical device makers must show the FDA how they plan to keep their devices updated and secure from digital threats. They also must provide a list of all software components using a software bill of materials that go into their devices so they can, can any vulnerabilities can be quickly spotted and fixed right away. Now, these new rules are part of the law that Congress actually passed in 2023, which sets some basic cybersecurity standards for medical devices. Now, the FDA is also looking for into how to actually make sure the medical devices are serviced securely and safely and is asking for feedback on this topic. So we actually provide some of that. The FDA's actions are part of a larger effort to actually boost the security and resilience 
of health IT. But experts actually warn that there's still a lot of work to be done here and to prevent hackers from compromising those medical devices and putting your patients at risk. Now, the FDA's new guidance is an important step in the right direction, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. Now, I'm going to bring Cheever back in here because, you know, what are your recommend? You're a network guy. What are your recommendations here on how to protect medical devices from cyber threats? Well, actually, I think this is a really, really good first step, mostly because Kurt has actually brought this up when we talk about this theme. And the problem is right now, or at least until these rules take effect, a change even in, say, something like um, modifying, say, a CT machine, you actually have to get it recertified even though you're just patching bugs. Well, I, this might be blowing it a little bit out of proportion, but there has been horror stories about medical instrument people saying they can't change X because it was approved with Y. Um, it's, it's frustrating. And I'm, this is just me, you know, talking out loud and thinking out loud that the FDA, I think, is trying to close those loopholes and make it easier to do things like major bug fixes, um, you know, adding this and that, maybe changing libraries if a um, DLL or something has been found that's um, compromised. Make it easier and faster for medical instrument developers to make intelligent changes. Um that we all know should be done, but their hands have been tied. And if you've ever really looked hard at the regular regulatory issues surrounding a medical instrument maker, you would throw up your hands in disgust and walk away because they are convoluted with a capital C. So I think this is a great move in the right direction. Um, I think some of the things that are changing are, uh, in the about time category and you know anyone with a good software background has been throwing up their hands because why hasn't this been done sooner and it's because when you have a uh, large governmental agency involved with making rules they're going to try and you know kill an ant with a sledgehammer and <laughs> it's true. It's really true. Now, I, I think it's definitely a good step in the right direction because obviously you always tend to look at organizations, especially they go and look at the medical devices that they're purchasing and they want things that are FDA approved. And so if this means that these devices and these, um, you know, these IoT devices, whatever they are, are not marked as as FDA approved because they are not following the guidelines that FDA mm -hmm. provides, I, I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a ding on people's bottom line, like the people are not going to buy them because of that. And I think, you know, that means that organizations are going to have to step up and start following these things. It's almost a forcing function for them to do so. Um, but I think there's still, the problem is there's still a ton, a ton of devices in this world right now that are already out there. They're already mm -hmm. insecure and they're already having problems. We've talked about this before. You obviously make sure things are patched, make sure you're using, you're updating passwords regularly, make sure things are not access, have access to the internet if they don't need it. Um, be, be careful of, you know, making sure that your information on those devices are secure. Um, you know, look for signs, obviously, of, of cybersecurity access. Obviously, this is um, uh, assume breach scenarios where if you if act, people are trying to access the, the, un, the device unexpectedly, you should know that. Um, keep track of that. So there's, there's lots of things that you can do to at least assist yourself and your organization on, on making sure that you keep these things secure. Chibber, does anything else to use you recommend to people to, to make sure that they're managing what they already have in their, in their inventory? Um, air gaps are truly wonderful things. You know, um, it's not hard to set up, say for instance, an isolated VLAN just for these things and don't give it internet access. Don't <laughs> really, don't make it so that the C, the CT scan operator can check their email on the console. That That's not a good combination. But I do want to bring up one other issue. As we start getting medical equipment that are, quote, not FDA approved because of these new rules, what's going to happen to them? Um, the used medical equipment market, I think, is going to explode. And I keep wondering where they're going to go. So if we have nice, strong rules in the U.S., 
are they going to go to second and third world nations? You know, I, I don't like those labels because they're, um, they connotate the wrong things, but there are several have not uh, organizations that would probably be real interested in buying used medical equipment, but I'm hoping they um, exercise some intelligence on how they use that equipment and also protect their patients' privacy. Um, just because we change our rules doesn't mean it's going to make it affordable for everybody else. Right. Yeah. I wish there was a grandfathered rule where, you know, a pre-existing devices, even if you buy them, are required to still provide uh, software bill materials are also required you to provide, you know, when, how long they're going to be, how often and how long they're going to be, you know, serviced and, and brought up to date. I feel like this is still needs to be a requirement. There's still a bunch of things missing there. Um, and yeah, I do agree. Like this is definitely going to force organizations if they have the money to upgrade and move these things out into the secondary market, uh, which, you know, there'll definitely be a flood out there of people trying to make back that cost. But that also means that manufacturers are going to want to make back their costs, right? Like they, this, this is going to make it, this is going to cost them even more money to manage what they ship. Yeah. And I I guess this is, again, my personal opinion is what happened folks. Um, This is actually doing things that make sense. If nothing else, that software bill of materials should have been something you had internal. You know, if no, you know, if wishes were fishes, you know, there's, there's a lot of wishful thinking going on here. And I'm, I'm hoping and praying that the DevOps people, well, development folks for a lot of these medical instrument companies have paid attention. Um, and that software bill of materials really should have been part of their original documentation, even if it's only internal. So, If you guys have been paying attention, maybe, just maybe, this would be a new set of rules that are easy to comply with or should be easy to comply with or I wish were easy to comply with. Choose your, you know, A, B, or C. There's a lot of things that can be done, should be done, but have they been done? So, folks, the FDA cybersecurity policy regarding the medical devices aims to create a robust and secure environment for their critical tools and helping patients health and well-being by advocating and being proactive with these types of cybersecurity measures and collaborating amongst their stakeholders the fda seeks to ensure the safety of well-being of the well-being of patients and safeguarding their cybersecurity data and protecting patients sensitive information In our next story, we will discuss a new report revealing that the smart TVs, folks, yes, your smart TVs are considered the most vulnerable for cyber attacks. That's right, your smart TVs. You never thought about this, right? With the increasing prevalence of internet-connected devices in their homes, IoT, Internet of Things, this uh, types of uh, security underscores the importance of these devices and having them protected Yes, folks, your smart TVs. Smart TVs often have a wide range of functionalities, right? From streaming devices, browsing the internet, even playing games. They have become an attractive item for cyber criminals due to the wide range of adoption and their lax security measures. Listen to this, folks, lax security measures. The vulnerabilities of smart TVs can be exploited by various ways, such as unauthorized access to sensitive information, eavesdropping on conversations, and even taking control of your device for malicious purposes. The reports highlight several, a report that is, highlights several factors um, contributing to the heightened risk associated with smart TVs. The first one that we will discuss are many users maintain uh, unwilling, or they're unaware that is, other potential threats, taking uh, a lack of proper basic security measures. And we've talked about that in our show as well, right? And we know what the first one is, correct? Passwords, that's right, having a passphrase. Second, manufacturers often prioritize user experience by functioning uh, with over robust security, leaving devices weak protected against attacks. Meaning that the manufacturers, when they ship your device to you, you'll get a standard 
user ID and password. Usually it's admin with the password being admin or the password being the word password. And it comes right out of the box. But as a user, you need to change that, folks. Like we've always stated in the show, you must change these passwords before you attach them to your home network system. Now, to mitigate these risks, many of us have become more proactive when using our smart TV devices, right? By having regular updates to the frame to the um, firmware within your device. Yes, that's right, folks. Your smart TV does have it is a computer, and it has to be updated with new updated firmware and software from the manufacturer. Now, you may say, "Well, how do I do this?" You need to contact your manufacturer, or make sure you contact your company where you purchase your TV from and find out how to make sure that you have the latest firmware updates on your computer system from your for your smart TV. This will keep you in a more proactive stance or proactive posture to ensure that the user's data and privacy can be protected. A new report of this smart TV and cyber attack serves as a reminder of the importance of cybersecurity in an increasing connected world. Users and manufacturers must take necessary steps to safeguard these devices and protect sensitive data. For more on this report, folks, we could bring you a story from Sky News Australia. A new, a new cyber security report has found smart TVs are most vulnerable to attack. Tell us more. Yeah, Tim, this is the uh, Bitdefender and Netgear 2023 report on IoT security. And I, it makes us some sobering reading because uh, we have all these devices in our home and uh, the most vulnerable to attacks is actually your smart TV at 52%. And then there's, there's a smart plugs at 30%. Then your router at 9%. Many people get a router and never update the password. And it's usually simple. These are easy vectors to get into your home. You, know, you look at all these devices. Australians have an average like, I think around 20 IoT devices. America, like 46. And I think there's a an average of eight attacks a day on a home. So we are little networks and the bad guys are out there trying to get us. And so if you look at smart TVs, for example, Tim, uh, they're adding cameras to them to do physical exercises, to do calls, that sort of stuff. And that sort of started the pandemic. pandemic. So uh, this report really says to me that um, manufacturers have to be switched on to really shore up our home in terms of keeping out the bad guys it's a reminder to us, Barry, that you switch on the wall, your TV, and be a victim in. It's unlikely, but it can happen. In our next story, folks, we'll discuss a key topic related to the involving landscape of cybersecurity. Nation states, folks, as threats of nation states against here in the U.S., uh, the role of artificial intelligence and cybersecurity jobs shortage in the U.S. First, the nation states. The threats of nation states against cybersecurity has been a significant threat amongst the civilians here in the U.S. and, of course, around the world as well. But in recent years, focus has been on nation states such as China, Russia, and North Korea. And also added to that list is Iran, too, have identified as major players of nation states sponsored cyber attacks. Uh, these attacks have often aimed to steal sensitive information, disrupting critical infrastructure, and conducting espionage. The sophisticated nation, the sophisticated nature, that is, of the nation states' threats require a concrete efforts by our governments and private industries working together to collaborate to fight against these types of cyber attacks. Our second one is artificial intelligence. Can artificial intelligence be used to help cybersecurity professionals like myself and others in our industry? And the answer to that is yes. The help or the aid of AI, artificial intelligence, can provide cybersecurity professionals with a robust information and have access to it instantly on how to thwart cyber attacks within the networks that we're operating in. Rather than taking us hours or days to go through logs to find out certain uh, certain uh, things that we're looking for when it comes to cyber attacks, AIs can do it for us within seconds. And these are the type of things that we do and definitely appreciate when you will, and we will use in AI. However, we're also looking at the bad guys as well. They're also looking at AI and helping them to fake out our customers and other businesses to steal sensitive data. 
So, and the next part of this particular story we want to get to here in a minute uh, concerns the cybersecurity job shortage. Folks, according to the U.S. Bureau of, La of Labor Statistics, the demand of cybersecurity professionals has expect is expected to grow by 31 percent between 20. 20 and 2029. The shortage leaves organizations vulnerable to cyber attacks and emphasizes the need for an increased investment in cybersecurity education and training. Folks, so now you see why I do what I do here on this show is to get this message out to our younger folks or anyone who wants to invest in learning cybersecurity awareness because it's there is a need for more soldiers to be on the front line to protect our infrastructure and our sensitive data. For more on this report, we have a story for you coming from CNBC. A lot to look at when it comes to cybersecurity. We mentioned a few different countries, regions where threats could come from. So right now, if you were talking to a CEO of another company about the biggest threat that their company should prepare for, which country would it be and what kind of attacks? Yeah, it really, really depends on the industry, but you know, there's definitely an elevated um, threat environment out there. And, and these are the exact countries that you mentioned. Um, you know, Russia, obviously, a major source of, of a lot of these very disruptive attacks. Um, Russia, as you mentioned, I mean, some of these attacks are government aided. Some of them are uh, permitted by the government, let's say. Um, then if you kind of look at China, obviously, uh, political influence, um, IP theft, data theft. I mean, that's all um, that we're seeing from the activity uh, that's born in that country and all in all i mean iran is also a source of of some disruption mentioned north korea same there a lot of these have different motives so it really is dependent on what type of industry you're at um but again the uh threat landscape is completely in an elevated activity state right now so as we've seen the transition over to the cloud that's kind of heightened some cybersecurity concerns um here in the u.s we've taken taken steps already to limit the amount of chips that go to different governments as far as our cloud infrastructure in the United States, how vulnerable is it to uh, attacks from cybersecurity players, uh, cyber attack players, I should say, out there? And is there any one region that's specifically targeting our cloud infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, it's it's all the same region, regions, all, all the same actors. And I think that the cloud itself might not be uh, more vulnerable than our on-premise networks. I think the combination of the two of them and the overall state um, of infrastructure, which is you know heavily antiquated, especially if you look at critical infrastructure, um, that's what creates more complexities, more blind spots, more vulnerabilities. Um, you know, tons of devices, a lot of different um, you know legacy products in our environment, and that creates just a massive amount of data, and it's really hard to try and you know grasp what's in your network and how do I protect it. What do I see out there? Do I see everything? Can I, you know, correlate everything? And can I find it? Um, you know, when someone is trying to attack my my environment, can I see what's happening? And can I react fast enough? Okay, so we've been aware of the cybersecurity, you know, issues around the uh, around the globe since the start of the Ukraine war. I guess we've had heightened awareness. But the emergence of AI, that's definitely changed things. So I want to ask you something. According to the White House, we have a major shortage of cybersecurity professionals here in the United States. Uh, according to their data, set more than 700,000 cybersecurity positions are unfilled. That's about 40 percent of the positions unfilled here in the U.S. How does AI change the landscape when it comes to cybersecurity here in the U.S. and globally? Yeah, significantly. I think AI um, is really the answer right now to how you deal uh, which is such an immense shortage. And I think you can um, kind of see tangible uses of AI right now to do two things. Uh, one is up-level the skill sets where every junior analyst, every junior cybersecurity analyst can now be, um, you know, 10 times more productive or more proficient in their work. Um, that's the AI augmentation angle. I think the other thing you get with AI um, and definitely the recent developments is scale and speed. Um, the ability to traverse all that data um, you know, petabyte scale of data sometimes in incredible speed, sometimes also um, in real time. So in both of these fronts, this is the way to scale the sales force. It's empowering the defenders to be better at what they do, but also creating, you know, think about it as entry level cybersecurity analysts that are really machine born that you can scale pretty much infinitely with, with software. Um, that is the way um, for us to start fighting back and also bringing some order, um, you know, into what we're seeing in networks out there.
You know, Tomer, one other question. Our big story today is First Republic Bank being taken over by J.P. Morgan. Um, some articles out over the weekend citing that cybersecurity stocks have been battered since the, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. How does the banking crisis impact the cybersecurity sector? Hope it's not a sore point, but looking at your stock, underperforming over the last month or so. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's any direct impact, but obviously in a very volatile macro environment, um, you know, technology companies are impacted. The financial sector is obviously obviously a big consumer of cybersecurity products. So there's some element of direct impact. I think generally it's a very, very volatile environment. Um, you know, a lot of customers from all industries are looking into the economy and they're obviously um, want to make sure that they consume as much as they need. So they're right sizing their investments. Um, so you see them, you know, making sure that they optimize uh, as much as they can on their contracts. Um, luckily, with some of the more modern cybersecurity solutions, you're actually able to up-level what you have in your environment and save some costs. Some of these legacy products that people have in their environment are actually incredibly expensive. So there's uh, there's definitely a move towards more modern infrastructure. But at the same time, I think that customers across industries um, are really being prudent with their spend. And like we say, folks, the evolving cybersecurity landscape uh, presents enormous opportunities and challenges for all of us from fighting against nation states to finding skilled professionals by leveraging AI and investing in cybersecurity workforce and development. We can work harder and look forward to securing our infrastructure here in the U.S. Folks, hackers and criminals are always looking for ways to be vulnerable to combat against us, to look way to exploit us. And we must stay vigilant and we must stay aware. Like we say on the show, Cybersecurity Awareness TV, hashtag stay cyber woke. We'll be back, folks, after these messages. Hi, I'm Judy Mario. I invite you to watch my show, What's Your Story with Judy Mario, on WWDB TV, where I interview celebrities, doctors, authors, professional speakers, and just plain folks like you and me. So watch my show and also watch some of the other great shows that we have here on WWDB TV. And you can also find us on Roku. Hi everybody, I'm Ruth Phillips here inviting you to join me every Saturday from 12 to 1 p.m. right here on Worldwide Digital Broadcasting TV on my show, Aaron Zauer with Aaron Phillips. I bring to you the movers and shakers of Las Vegas and really all around the world. It's also fun, entertaining, silly, goofy, informative, everything you'd want to be entertained by on a Saturday, except no politics, no religion. As I said, it's designed to be a fun show. Remember, that's every Saturday from 12 to 1 p.m. Pacific, right here, Aaron Zauer, Worldwide Digital Broadcasting TV. Hi, folks. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Awareness TV. I'm your host, Mac Jackson, Jr. In this segment, we're talking about FBI files and warnings. Folks, the FBI, again, has warned and alarmed consumers to be aware of different types of scams when it comes to grants this week, as well as a new scam called pig butchering. Yes, folks, a strange term, but pig butchery. Wow, the media always has some really interesting names for different types of scams, and now that's an interesting one, too. But first, we'll talk about the grant scam. The grant scams involve cyber criminals, hackers, scammers, um, posing as government agencies or reputable organizations offering fake grants to unsuspecting victims. Now, you're thinking that, yes, you can definitely sense and tell when these people are trying to scam you, right? A lot of us will say, oh, I'll just delete the files. I'll, that'll never happen to me. It has happened to a lot of professionals as well, folks. These scammers work 24 seven. Yes, that's right, folks. They work 24 seven in underground gatherings on how to exploit and scam people. So it's not like someone just picking up the phone randomly and trying to scam you. There's actually training that these scammers are doing, according to the FBI. These scammers often ask for personal information and uh, upfront payments in order to participate in some sort of application fee, ultimately, ultimately um, de defrauding the individuals and stealing their sensitive data. It's amazing, folks. We must be vigilant. These stories, make sure that you tell friends and family to watch out for this. Here's our first story coming to you from KVUE News, Austin, Texas. 
According to the Federal Trade Commission, imposter schemes are the most common schemes in our area. It's usually someone posing as a government official, like an IRS employee. But when a viewer found herself in a web of lies after being told she could get a government grant, she called the KVU Defenders for help. Here's investigative reporter Erica Proffer. At first glance, this may look like a typical Facebook page. And if someone you know told you they got money from this group, it may be easy to overlook the red flags. I, I just fell for it. A KVU viewer reached out to the defenders after she lost more than $1,500. She asked us to not show her face nor reveal her name because the people she says conned her know where she lives. I'm just looking over my shoulder. I mean, I don't know where these people are. We'll call her Susie. You know, I, I don't know really what to do. Susie says someone posing as a family member reached out to her through Facebook Messenger, told her to contact this group, Community Empowerment Block Grant. A short application could get her thousands of dollars to use in any way she wanted. No qualifications listed. So it's asking everything from your name to where you live, what you do, how much you make. Susie figured it was typical application info. I had to do the front and back of my license. But then... Then that's when they want this, the verification fee. They said all she had to do was pay a fee using gift cards. Yeah. So, Susie yeah. suggested taking fees out of her grant money. Why do I need to give you anything? Just take it out of that. But was told gift cards only. I immediately said, what? A red flag she caught. I go, what's going on here? So she went back to the message she thought was from family, thought it was someone she trusted and usually communicated with via messenger. Still didn't know it was an imposter. So I said, are you sure this is not a scam? I'm asking my right. family member. And I, apparently something with this message that's unavailable mm -hmm. must have said, no, it's not. Per the instructions, Susie spent more than $1,500 on gift cards from Xbox, Foot Locker, Sephora, and Steam. Take the picture, scratch it off so he can get the pin number. Then got this reply. Thursday. Yeah. Thought she would be paid nearly $100,000. Okay. See you next time. No truck arrived but it is in custody of the state tax officer. The next message asks for more money. They're asking for a verification fee yeah. and a package legitimate fee yeah. and a security fee. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This time she picked up the phone and called her family, the one she thought she was messaging. And I said, did you receive your money? This was a double impersonation. And she's like, what are you talking about? One as a relative, the other as a business. I should have called her in the beginning, but I, I didn't have the feel like I needed to do that. If you get contacted by somebody you think you know, or who purports to be somebody you know, the likelihood of falling for a scam increases exponentially. Zulfikar Ramzan is the chief scientist at Aura, a cybersecurity company using artificial intelligence for various online protections. We just did a recent survey at Aura and found that more than 90% of people are at moderate to high risk of becoming victims of scams, which at first sounds like an astonishingly high number. That sounds like a big number. That, but the reality is that nowadays, scammers have access to a treasure trove of information about us. There's yeah, so the trends here in Austin are, are similar across the nation. Jason Hudson is the FBI assistant special agent in charge for the Austin area. So looking at it nationally, which again is very similar to what we're seeing here, uh, the numbers continue to go up. Federal records show more fraud cases in our area involve imposter scams than sweepstakes, lotteries, fake investments, and phone scams combined. Scams have become even more and more complex using multiple facets. A common thread is the form of payment scammers request, typically gift cards or cryptocurrency. Gift cards are hard to track. Hudson says a person who falls for an online scam should take three immediate steps. Contact your bank, contact your credit card company, and file a police report with local and federal law enforcement. If this guy had come out of the blue and was like, hey, I would never, money. would never, I would right. never, ever, ever have, I would, I would have deleted it. About that group Susie says she gave her information, via the Community Empowerment Block Grant Facebook page, we found two pages, dozens of people requested info, dozens of potential victims. But look closely. It says it's a health and beauty website. No other details listed in the About section. These pictures? Not legit. We found a picture of this woman holding a box came from a university website. And this post showing stacks of money was in a 2013 article on drug cartels. Another picture of money traces back to a news article about cash found in a pizza box. How I fell for this is 
I'm beating myself up. Susie tried getting her money back. Xbox, Foot Locker, Sephora, nor Steam would issue refunds. She paid for the cards with cash. I was just led in the beginning not to worry about this. It's not only money lost in these types of scams. It's your sense of security, it's your peace. It is, it's a peace of mind that I don't have. I mean, this is my sanctuary. Fearing for her safety, Susie plans to move out of her apartment once her lease ends. I don't want anyone to go through what I've gone through, and I just want people to be aware. So remember, if you're dealing with someone who wants you to purchase gift cards for payment, that's a huge red flag. Stop communicating with them. We have more tips on how to avoid falling victim to this type of scam and what to do if you think you have. It's online with this story at kbu.com. With the KBU Defenders, I'm Erica Proffer. Our next FBI warning, folks, has to do with the, quote, pig butchering. Yes, folks, this is a scam called pig butchering. And this type of scam is a romance scam where fraudsters manipulate victims into developing a emotional attachment before extorting money from them. The scam preys on the emotions of victims and leads to significant financial losses. This scam comes from overseas in China, where it originally started from. But folks, again, like I said earlier, the actual scammers practice this. They are trained in this. It's not like they just willy-nilly trying to find a victim. They have working, they are working, that is, on this 24-7. That's why we must be vigilant and let our friends know to be prepared and uh, protect ourselves against these types of scams. Here's a story coming to you from News Nation Morning News in America. There's a new wave of scams hitting everyday Americans, and the scammers can rope us in with a simple hello. Most of these text message scams are based in Asia, often carried out on behalf of organized criminal networks. Our Dre Clark is live this morning with the latest on these scams and how you can protect yourself. Dre, good morning. Mitch, good morning. You know, almost everywhere you go, someone has a cell phone in their hand. And for every cell phone in use, sophisticated scam artists see an opportunity. Now the FBI is once again sounding a big alarm about this relatively new scam that people keep falling for. Here's how it works. The scammers make a strong appeal uh, to your ego, and they also come across as very affectionate. And then once they gain your trust, they bleed your bank account dry. Now, the FBI calls this scam pig butchering. The scam originating out of Asia usually starts with a text message from someone just saying hi. The victim in pig butchering scams are referred to as pigs because the scammers use flattery to fatten up their target's ego and trick them into believing they're talking to someone who's romantically interested in them. Once the scammers are successful, they convince their victims to invest in fake cryptocurrency trading. The FBI says the scammers make the investments look very legit by creating fake websites and fake investment portfolios showing large positive returns on the victim's investments. But when victims try to make withdrawals, they're told they have to pay a 20 percent tax on their money. And after they pay the tax and pretty much empty out their bank accounts, the scammers disappear, the fake websites shut down, and the victims lose their money. Now, some people have lost close to a million dollars being scammed, but the FBI says many victims are too embarrassed to come forward. The agency also saying that more than $3 billion was lost last year to investment scams, just like pig butchering. Experts say if you get a random strange text, don't click the link and do not text with strangers, no matter how nice they seem. If it is accompanied by a link or something where you are having to type something, don't do it. Can it be stopped entirely? I don't think so. Why? Because we're in a digital age. All they want is a callback or a click on the link. Any one of those and they've got you. Yeah, another investment, cam, uh, investment scam rather is called smishing, and it involves scammers sending people text messages uh, that look like they're coming from very legit and legal companies and corporations like bank uh, bankers, or I should say banks, as well as credit card companies. And once you click the link, all of your personal information is downloaded, which gives the scammers access to your bank account. And once again, they bleed you dry. Now, of the more than $3 billion lost last year, the FBI was only able to recover a fraction of the money. That's about $100 million. So you got to be very careful what? when you get those text messages, Mitch and Adrian. $100 million. Gosh. So you're telling me all these people That's online it. that say that I am 
so handsome and good at my job that they just want to do business with me, they're not being truthful? You get texts about that? About being handsome? Instagram DMs. Oh, okay. Well, those yes, are, I do. Those are, those are fans. Yeah. Those aren't random scammers. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage. Folks, it is essential that consumers remain vigilant, verify all types of authorized offers asking you for information, personal identifiable information. If you see anything that looks suspicious, report it. In other words, folks, vet, vet everybody, everybody that you want to be involved with romantically. If you get an offer coming into you for a grant or any type of loan, definitely vet it. And if you have to pay money for it, make sure that you make sure that's legitimate. And folks, these scammers are very, very good at their craft. Like I mentioned before, they're using all types of techniques. They're also using AI, artificial intelligence, by having a voice of a family member, your family member, asking for money to throw you off guard. Always pause, tell them to call them back, and find out other ways to get through them. Check out their websites, ask somebody, make sure that you protect yourselves from these types of scams. That's one of the ways that we can make sure that we can avoid this type of scams. But what you could do right now is to tell a friend about what you learned on this show. Remember folks, hashtag stay cyberwoke. We'll be right back after these messages. Hello folks, this is Mac Jackson Jr. from Vanderson Cyber Group. The problem with businesses today is that they are affected by cyber attacks from around the world, but companies are not sure of what to do. Normally, they are reactive instead of proactive. But folks, cyber attacks can affect your bottom line and will affect you financially, legally, and your business reputation. Here at Vanderson Cyber Group, we can help you develop a policy by training your employees on what to do if they are involved in a cyber attack and how to mitigate it and fight against it. Folks, we call it here, hashtag stay cyber woke. And that's Vanderson Cyber Group here in Las Vegas and around the world. You can reach me, folks, at VandersonCyberGroup.com or my website, MacJacksonJr.com as well. Here locally, 702-868-0808. Give us a call today, folks. We must fight back. Hi folks, welcome back to Cybersecurity Awareness TV. I'm your host, Mac Jackson Jr. This is segment three. And in this segment, like we do every week, we talk about cybersecurity tips, business productivity, what you can do to protect yourselves. Well, this week, folks, we will start like we always do, passwords, absolutely, folks. We wanna drill that in and talk to you about your password. Make sure you have strong passwords. And by that, take it to the next level. Use a passphrase and not just a simple word, but a passphrase, folks. And now, as of May 6, 2023, that passphrase should be at least 18 to 20 digits long. That's right, folks. Upper lowercase letters, a special character, must be 20, 20 characters long. Um, right now, because Hackers are working continuously, like we always say on the show, to try to find and get your information on your devices. Now, one of the things that we talked about on our show, and I've gotten emails from it, and, and viewers and clients have asked me, um, of the rumors that if your phone is sitting by you and you have a conversation with someone, is your phone listening to you, right? You're talking to someone about wedding plans, and then the next thing you know, you bring up your phone and you go to one of your browsers and you will see advertisements regarding weddings or regarding maybe purchasing an NFL jersey. And you're thinking, wow, I was just talking to someone about that. How did my phone know? The question is, is my phone or are your phones listening to you? Well, folks, they can be listening to you, but you could stop that. Did you know that? That's right. 
When you load apps on your phone, your phone asks you three use commands and asks your permission. One of them, it asks for, do you, can it have access to your microphone? Now, a lot of us were trying to get to the app, so we're not paying attention. We'd say, yeah, go ahead, sure, because you figure that the app, you're going to speak with it. Think about that, folks. Like we always say, just stop before, think before you click. That's the whole premise of this particular segment. Think before you click. Before you click on it, read it carefully. You have an option to say, use this, this app can use my microphone when I'm using the app, only when you're using the app, not at any time. And if you tell it, no, don't use it at all, that means when you go to use the app, the app itself will say, I need to use your mic. Well, then you have to think about, well, what is, why is this app wanting to use my microphone? If it should not have permission, don't allow it. Turn it off. Next, camera. Does the app really need your camera? Why? Why is the app wanting to have your camera, especially if it's a game that you're playing? <laughs> Seriously? No, folks. And a third one? Access to your files, your photos. Really? We're going to let an app have access to our files and photos on our smart device? No, turn all those off. And you can do that within your phone settings under security. You can go through your apps and you can turn off all of those particular type of securities. And again, let's go over them again. Microphone, camera, and files. Those are the main, the main ones. Oh, and the other fourth one, folks, and it's very important as well, the fourth one, location. Turn off the location, folks. You, wanna, you don't wanna have an app that helps you with your grammar know where you're staying. Why is it have to, why would the app need to know that? Right? So make sure you turn off those. That will give you extra layer of protection. Those are just some of the things folks I'd like you guys to remember this week and also remember to tell a friend as well. You can find out more about this and other services that I have with my company by going to my website, MacJacksonJr.com. That's MacJacksonJr.com. Definitely send me your questions, your emails. Definitely we'll take a look at them and we'll research them and get back with you on on them. Um, also, if you need cybersecurity policies and procedures for your organizations, you can contact my business, Vanderson Cyber Group, and we will help your company understand the cyber threats, help you enforce and strengthen your cybersecurity posture within your organization, and be in compliant. That's all we have for you this week, folks. I want to thank you again for joining us on Cybersecurity Awareness TV. We will be back next week. Remember, folks, hashtag stay cyberwoke. I'm Mac Jackson, Jr. See you then.